All right, so welcome to the New Year, New You lecture. Um, we don't necessarily want a whole new you because you're probably a lovely <laughs> individual all as you are, but sometimes we just want to kind of fresh start or improve on something with our health. So I'm here to hopefully give you a couple ideas and, and maybe help you get started on something that would help you on your path to health. So if you have any questions as we go, we can certainly talk about those. One of the things that I talk about often at lectures is how nutritional deficiencies and organ dysfunction feed into a symptom that you might be having. So I think almost everybody here is newer to me, so I'm gonna tell my story a little bit. So if you've heard it, sorry. <laughs> but most people here are fresher faces, so I'm gonna tell you my story. So I came to the office in 2007 as a patient. Um, I came because I was having back pain that was debilitating to the point of impacting me being able to do my job. At the time, I was a dance teacher and a Pilates instructor. Um, I was and still am a mom, but my kids were young at the time, so I was trying to be a mom and teach dance and do other things. I was running half marathons, and I ended up on my floor, flat on my back, not able to move. Um, and, I, and it happened very suddenly. I'd been having some back pain. I'd been having some little bit of an idea that something wasn't great, but I was still functioning very well. And then all of a sudden, it literally put me on my back. I had to call my husband home from work. I had to, well, <laughs> convince him to take me to my chiropractor at the time because he saw me laying on the floor and said, okay, so we're going to the ER. And I said, no, I think that's a bad idea. Um, I think we should go to my chiropractor. And he said, you've never been on the floor when I've come home before. I think we should do something a little more, a, a little more aggressive than that. And I begged him to drive me to my chiropractor, who at that time was an hour away from our house. Um, and she started the process of helping me. Um, she thought it had something to do with my bladder at the time. Um, I learned more and more over the years that it probably did, um, but I now know that I think I had a virus that was affecting my spine. I ended up later in the medical model because I wanted to find out what was going on with me. I did end up at the doctor. They did, after much of my begging, do an MRI, and I was diagnosed with osteomyelitis. So they were first telling me, you have arthritis, you're just getting old. And I said, I am 36. I am not just getting old. I'm a dance teacher. I'm a Pilates teacher. I have my nutrition degree. I'm healthy. This is not arthritis. And they kind of told me it was, and to just be quiet and take my meds for inflammation. And I really pushed to get the MRI. And that's when they called me in a very serious state and said, we think you need IV antibiotics and surgery. And I said, wait a minute, we went from you have arthritis and you're making this up to now I have osteomyelitis and now you want me on IV antibiotics. I think I want to do something different. And that is, I was already seeing Dr. Schmidt at the time. I, start, I had been seeing him three visits when I got that diagnosis. And I came into the office um, and cried <laughs> because I was very scared because I didn't have that diagnosis when I started seeing him. Um, and then once I got it, I, I got scared because they scared me at the doctor and said, you're gonna have to do these IV antibiotics. And so I sat in a room and I was waiting for him and I was crying and then he came in and he checked me and he was trying to leave and I was still crying. <laughs> and I said, I just don't know what to do. And he said, well, I do tell this story publicly, so he doesn't mind it, I don't think. He said, what have you got to lose? And he started to walk out of the room. And I said, wait, you have to come back here. <laughs> I, I have a lot to lose. I, I'm a mom, and I, I'm, they're telling me I'm very sick, and so I feel like I have a lot to lose. What should I do? And he basically said, are you feeling better since your first visit? And I was three visits in, and I said, yeah, I am. Not near, you know, not, nothing near what I have accomplished since, 
but I was feeling better. I was sleeping better. I was having less headaches. I was having some relief with my back pain. It wasn't, it was not perfect because I had a serious diagnosis, but it was better. And he said, well, what have you got to lose? So basically he was right. It, you know, I was either going to try the nutrition and see how it went, or I was going to try what the medical model was saying. And I think that would have sent me down a a very slippery slope because I don't tolerate antibiotics well at all. So I went his direction and it was at that visit where I cried so hard that he, I, I decided that I would work here as well. So I, I thought at the time like I can do this, I can help people too. And so I drove home calling my husband on the phone and saying, I think I'm going to work at this place. And he's like, you sound like you're crying. And I said, well, I kind of was crying and I, I was upset today in my visit, but I think I'm going to work at this place. And I, I had my nutrition degree, so I brought my resume to my next visit and I said, I want to work here too. So I started out as Dr. Schmidt's assistant and with time started doing the training myself so i would fly to florida do the training to do the work got <coughs> certified to do testing and and be uh be a practitioner here so now i see my own patients i have since 20 2011 i started seeing my own patients but i started here with him in 2007 and it's been it, fantastic for my health um I do this to help other people with theirs because it's, it, there's, for me, when I came here to see him, I didn't know this type of thing even existed. I didn't know that there were alternatives to what the doctor was telling me. It was, it, it was great to know there were other options and that it was nutritional and wouldn't give me negative side effects and I could just feel better. I tell people, you know, when I first came in, I, I considered myself very healthy. I, I thought I was doing great. I was 36 years old. But when I look back now, I am now almost 50. I'll be 50 next month. Um, I am healthier now than I was then. I had almost daily headaches. I had, um, I was much heavier than I am now. I had, a lot of different strange symptoms like allergies and chronic sinus infections that I had a surgery for when I was 21 because I had cysts in my sinuses and the doctors told me, oh, you have a deviated septum and you have cysts in your sinuses and I followed that advice because that was before I was here. That was the worst surgery I can <coughs> even fathom. I, I can't, it was horrible. Um, very invasive. I vomited for a long time after because of the anesthesia and things like that. And so vomiting when your nose is packed with stuff and it, it was horrible. Um, so that was a horrible surgery that I probably could have avoided had I come here earlier. But all those things, I had all these chronic things that I was just writing off to normal because I had been told they kind of were. I had had those, had those almost daily headaches since I was a kid. And so for me, that was so normal on my intake with Dr. Schmidt, they're not even there. Like, you know, we ask about when people come in as a new patient, we ask about symptoms. I didn't even say it. I just thought it was normal. And I thought that was something I was gonna have to deal with for the rest of my life. And as I started to get better, the first day I remember not having a headache, I thought, well, this is weird. I don't have a headache. And I didn't really think about that that wasn't normal <laughs> to not have a headache. So symptoms can relate to nutritional deficiencies. So I was deficient in vitamin C. I didn't have what I needed for my liver to work well. I wasn't detoxing well. I did have viral load. I, I had some viruses that were stuck in my body. What Dr. Schmidt found with the testing that we do here, we do muscle testing, was it was more viral than bacterial. The bacterial, where the medical model was saying bacteria, it's bacteria. And I said, well, how do you know that? You didn't draw my blood. You didn't test anything. You're just telling me it's bacteria. And they said it always is. And I thought, well, okay, but I don't know how you know that. It just didn't make sense, and I, I, wasn't, I, I wasn't following their reasoning. And so Dr. Schmidt had found virus. That's what we worked on over the years, and that's how my back improved, was working on kind of viral load. So I say all that to say you can have any number of symptoms, but if you correct the organs that aren't functioning well, 
and you correct the nutri nutritional deficiency, the symptom actually goes away. So it's not that you're covering up a symptom like a Band-Aid, like you, you, know, you would take something that would help with a symptom like reflux. You take something that makes that reflux go away, but it's not really making it go away. It's suppressing the symptom. We can actually sometimes fix things. We fix the organ that's not working. We fix the nutritional deficiency, and then sometimes the symptom just goes. So we don't treat things, we don't diagnose, we just correct nutritional deficiencies. And sometimes, just by nature of what we do, the symptom goes away too. A lot of this is diet. A, a lot of it is working on improving your own diet so that you can boost yourself nutritionally with the foods you eat, but sometimes a supplement just gets you that little bit there faster, like a little nudge in the right direction. So, diet. Diet gets a bad name, bad rap. I said earlier before all of you were here, I don't like the you know term like New Year's resolutions and things like that because I think that's a little bit too short term and short, short kind of planning. I like the idea of we make these changes almost like an evolution over time. So literally diet by dictionary definition is food and drink regularly provided or consumed. It is not a fad. It is not something you do for the short term to try to lose weight to fit into a dress. It is more a lifestyle evolution over time. So my diet is not perfect. I do not stand up in front of any patient and ever say I eat perfectly. But my diet over the years has evolved better and better and better. I have tried many different what I would call elimination style diets where I am doing something very specific and I'm eliminating broad groups of food for the short term without the intention of doing it forever, but with the intention of resetting sometimes. So sometimes when I do say diet, I am going to mean something more restrictive for the short term, but that's not necessarily meant to be like, this is your diet forever. Although some diets are great to be done forever. The first step to better health is eating good quality food, especially healthy fats and protein, and replacing your bad fats with good fats. Another thing that I do say is I try really hard not to say good and bad, because what does that even mean? It, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of gray in there between good and bad. And while some people might do very well on coconut oil and it might be a very healthy fat for them, for other people, they might be allergic to it. So I, I try to stay away from good and bad, the, those words, but sometimes it's, I'll throw it in there because it's easier and it, it is just a little, it is kind of true that there are some more generally good fats and there are some more generally bad fats. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, does everybody here kind of know margarine is a bad fat? Is that pretty well established? <laughs> Butter is a good fat, margarine is a bad fat, olive oil is a good fat, canola oil, bad fat. So it's, is that all, that's all pretty, pretty well known nowadays? Okay, all right, just making sure. Um, so that's kind of step one, is just kind of looking at what you're actually eating, maybe recording it and replacing some of the bad fats with good and eating more. Most people need more protein. Most people are under eating protein. I tell people start now, today, this minute. Don't, don't put it off till next week. It doesn't have to be a broad start. It's just a start. Make a plan and actually do it so that you're making some forward progress in some regard. So today's the day. You start. You pick one thing and do it. Sometimes I tell people, it's kind of the snowball, I might be using somebody else's language there, but the snowball philosophy. Sometimes you can pick something very small and build on it and just kind of keep making improvements. Sometimes it's easier to pick one big thing, start there, and then the little things will fill in from there. Everyone's different. If I could write a book that would say like, here is the diet that everyone should do, I would write it and then maybe retire, but I do like what I do, so probably not retire, but I would write it, but I don't think that necessarily is, is possible because I think every individual is different and that's where the care in this office comes in because we kind of can 
gear programs, nutritional programs to the individual, depending on what's going on. There are some broad things that apply to everyone, but there's always a little bit of wiggle room on either side. Um, step one for most people, if you've not done anything to change your diet, is start to reduce the sugar or carbohydrate content in your diet, but white refined sugar especially. Questions on anything? So far so good? Okay, sugar and body fat. With excess sugar slash carbohydrates, so now I'm kind of using them loosely and interchangeably here, not just white sugar, but sugar slash carbohydrate intake, the body releases insulin to decrease sugar in the bloodstream. But if you don't need all that energy, for example, if you're sitting on the couch, the body stores the excess as fat, and that can be in your arteries, around organs, in places you don't necessarily want it. So when you're overeating carbs, your body's storing that for later. And that's how we get the, the kind of fat buildup in places where we don't want. And some people do not look fat at all from the outside. Their bodies are very thin, but they will have kind of internal fat around their organs, causing those organs trouble. They'll be inflamed. So there are very thin marathon runners that might be carb loading that have fat around their organs. You don't see it from the outside necessarily, but they are, sometimes they just have so many carbs that they're not burning through, even if they're marathon running, that that's still laying down in their, in their body somewhere. I have a question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's the carbohydrates that build up. Yep. Um, maybe not super specifically on tape, <laughs> on camera, but I can try and answer it as best I can. Yeah, it's diet. So how, the question kind of came up, how you can reverse a fatty liver. You correct the diet, you drop the carbs, Usually protein has to go up, but there are some supplements that will help clean up livers too. And that is where I would get more specific with an individual, but I can talk about that in a little bit. Just remind me, remind me at the end. Um, one thing I do tell people to do, and this would go toward that question too, is count your macros. Macros means your carbohydrates, your protein and fat. Your micronutrients matter. You know, getting an adequate amount of vitamin A and vitamin C and things like this in your diet matter, but the bigger picture is going to be the macronutrients, your carbohydrates, your protein, and fat. There is an app called Chronometer, C-R-O-N-O-M-E-T-E-R, -E -E that is a good resource. It's a database, and you can put your food in, and it's gonna give you some numbers. It'll kick back numbers and tell you kind of what your macros look like. And then you can tweak accordingly. We talk about leveraging your numbers. So as your carbs go down, usually your protein can go up to keep you satisfied and full. And that gives you an adequate amount of energy. And then you leverage the fat against it so that you are eating enough fat to keep you full. But depending on what you're trying to do, if you're trying to lose weight, you can drop fat a little bit if you're trying to gain or maintain weight or you're working out very hard, the fat and protein can be a little bit higher. So you, you're leveraging numbers. There, again, here's a situation where there is no perfect number. However, we know that 72 grams of carbohydrates is about a max for keeping inflammation and health, keeping inflammation down and health good. That's kind of the magic number. That's from a book called The Schwartzbein Principle. Um, so that's, a, that's kind of the magic number I use for people. That is not a ketogenic number. That won't get someone into ketosis. Um, but everybody okay with that word? Ketosis, burning fat as fuel. So ketosis is a deeper state of low carb nutritional kind of recommendations. It's using fat as fuel instead of your carbohydrates and, and kind of sugars as fuel. It's a very healthy state. Um, not everyone needs to be in it, but it's being researched heavily for cancer therapies. Um, a lot of brain things like Alzheimer's um, are benefiting from some of the research being done with ketosis. So there's lots of information out there about that. There are whole lectures that Dr. Schmidt does about it. This is not designed to do that. 
but just know that's that's kind of the direction I was talking about when I'm talking about the you know kind of leveraging you can always go up and down a little bit but we can always get specific with people with their needs with that I go back to my graph from earlier. So earlier it said symptom nutritional deficiency and organ dysfunction. Now it says sugar and those things. So sugar will cause organs to be inflamed, organs to swell, organs to not do what they should be doing. And it absolutely causes nutritional deficiencies because in order to burn the sugar and carbohydrates, you need vitamin C. You need lots of minerals to, to burn that sugar off. So it causes some nutritional deficiencies. B vitamins certainly get very depleted by sugar and alcohol. That's kind of one of the main things that we talk about, that your B vitamins get very, very depleted. And fatty liver is almost a, always a B vitamin deficiency. So jumping back to your question again, that it's there's the, when there's a B vitamin deficiency, fatty liver is part of, part of kind of that picture too. Um, so... This is why we say, get rid of the sugar, get rid of your symptoms. So that's a big part of it. Really good, true food information is on a website called westonaprice.org. There is more information on this website than I have been able to read myself personally, but you can Google search, not Google search, you can search things on that site. Um, lots of great articles, lots of true food information, not necessarily they aren't being paid to say something. They're going to say the truth based on research. Lots of great information on this site about soy not being a healthy food. Lots of great information on the good fats. Um, Weston A. Price, big proponents of like raw milk and things like that, like eating from nature, eating from farms. So really good resource, not saying you have to eat all those things, just saying really good resource. So there is an app for them too that you know you can kind of shop with. It helps people with their shopping. But I tell people if you have questions about some of the things I say like why no soy, go to them because then they have the research to back it up. They've got published published research and that's good to look to. Weston A. Price. This is a slide from a lecture I attended from a Weston A. Price workshop. So in the 30s, the amount of food that was processed or denatured was much less than it is now today. So we have refined sugar, high fructose corn syrup, which is often genetically modified, white flour, pasteurized milk. We've gotten skim and low fat milk, so taking the good fats out of it, the hydrogenated fats, the refined vegetable oils, that's like your canola, your margarine, um, isolated protein powders and artificial sweeteners and additives in so many artificial colors artificial a lot in a lot of things so in the 30s there was much less problem with our food now a little more problem so this is a Weston A. Price information like incomplete protein powders so um, like Dr. Axe, the ancient nutrition would be a more complete protein powder when they're just taking kind of one thing like a, a whey protein powder would be almost like an isolate. Some are better than others, um, so not, you know, not necessarily saying they're all bad, but when they're taking kind of parts of it, it's, it's not a real food anymore, so it loses. So I always tell people, if you need a protein powder, because you're traveling, because you're very busy, because you can't meet your protein needs other ways for some reason, if somebody's very ill or doesn't have an appetite, then I would recommend a protein shake maybe in the short term. And there are good ones like the Ancient Nutrition, um, the bone broth pro proteins, collagen proteins, things like that. But some of the protein powders that are out there, you know, there's a lot of soy isolate protein shakes, and those would be very poor quality. So not giving you all the nutrition that you could get in a protein rich food. So I always tell people rely on foods wherever you can, but if you're going to have to do a protein powder, do a, do a good quality protein powder. This is just kind of a summary of the Weston A. Price um, slide from before. So in the past, our soil was more fertile. It, I learned in school 
because I have my nutritional degree, it's a, a traditional nutritional degree. From, I have a bachelor's from Madonna University. I'm very glad I have that degree because it taught me a lot. I worked at U of M for a while. That taught me a lot. Um, that learning the chemistry behind some of this, learning the, the kind of physiology behind some of this was very important to me. And I'm really glad I did, but the application of it was not correct. Um, going in and telling people to eat artificial sweetener when they had diabetes was not ethical in my world. I couldn't fathom it. I had written papers on how bad it was, and then I had to go tell people that when I taught them how to do the diabetic diet. So it, just, it felt wrong, it, it felt hard, and I had, well, I quit because I couldn't do it. I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. It felt unethical. Um, it's, it, now, you know, oh, sorry, that was, I was going down a different train of thought there. Um, in school, I learned that people shouldn't need vitamins. They should be able to eat a diet that's rich enough in their vitamins to not need a supplement. They didn't even call them supplements then. They called them vitamins. You shouldn't need a multivitamin. You should be able to eat your foods and get enough nutrition from it. But the fact is, our soil is now depleted. So it's very hard, and most people aren't eating bushelfuls of vegetables a day, and most people aren't eating an adequate amount of protein. It is hard to get an adequate amount of nutrition from our foods, a lot of it being because our soil isn't fertile. But even in places like Michigan, this is, you know, we're, we're the goiter belt, as it was kind of traditionally called, because we're not close to the coast. We don't have a lot of iodine in our soil, period. So people in the Midwest would develop goiters without iodine. So this is kind of the, the example of a nutrient that often needs to be supplemented because you're not getting enough of it in your food, even if you're doing healthy foods. If somebody's living on a coast, if they're eating a lot of seaweed and seafood, they might be getting a little bit more. But here in Michigan, often people aren't. So that's just one example. Vitamin D would be another. Um, B vitamins, but a lot of the minerals are deficient in our soil. That's where I was going on that tangent there. So in the past, our foods from our soil were more sufficient. People were eating organ meats a lot, more liver, more of the things that were, you know, kind of in traditional diets, more animal fats, pastured animals. Dairy products were often raw or fermented. Grains and legumes were soaked. People were doing bone broths. The sweeteners were honey, maple syrup, unrefined sweeteners. Um, vegetables were sometimes fermented. Fermented beverages like kombucha, unrefined sea salt, natural vitamins in foods, traditional cooking, traditional seeds. Now, here we are. <laughs> so we have more canned vegetables, soft drinks, refined salt. Um, synthetic vitamins, microwaving, GMO, depleted soil, um, vegetable oils. People have seen the documentaries where animals are inhumanely raised. So I am a big fan of meat. I get a grass-fed cow. I buy a share of a cow every year from a, a very healthy, humane farmer because I am a big fan of meat. I need meat to feel healthy. I need meat for enough energy, but I don't get necessarily commercial meat. I'll just leave it like that. The whys, we are in some of the situation we are in. One, one more Weston A. Price slide. Life in its fullness is Mother Nature obeyed. This is not Mother Nature obeyed in the pictures up above. Factory foods or products are not Mother Nature's foods. So I tell people, just concentrate on eating food. If you don't eat something that's in a box, you're doing good. <laughs> if you have to cook it, you're doing good. <laughs> it's, you know, if you're eating something from a box or a can or a jar, it's not always a real food. Not saying none of those things are, because there are some healthy options out there that are just preserved for convenience, and I use them. But ideally, it's not something that looks real bright and shiny like those <laughs> things up there. So. Some of the things that you can do, just planning ahead for your meals is huge. If you get to a situation where you're starving and you don't know what you're going to eat, your chances of eating something healthy are just lower. So the plan ahead and then do it is a key. My husband and I plan typically 
We got off track with the holidays. We're doing it again. Plan our meals for the week, our dinners. We don't plan our lunches. We don't plan our breakfast. We plan our dinners for the week. So every Sunday, we kind of think with what we might want to eat, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and buy it so that we've got the things that are ready or we're getting out meat the night before so that we can cook it the next day. It helps a lot. It doesn't always pan out. Sometimes we forget to take the meat out and we have to deviate from that plan. But by knowing ahead what we're going to do, we're able to actually accomplish it. So that's step one. Um, eating protein for breakfast or trying intermittent fasting or fatty coffee for breakfast. The fatty coffee thing, so this is the bulletproof kind of coffee philosophy. If someone is trying to lose weight, you do have to be careful with fatty coffee. It's if you're eating more fat than you're able to burn in a day, depending on what your activity level is, you can't just be adding tablespoons of fat to a beverage. It doesn't have to be coffee, it could be tea that you're drinking. So when I was working toward intermittent fasting and taking longer and longer fasting windows, I would put fat in my coffee to get my body able to fast longer. Um, I really am a fan of cacao butter because it almost tastes a little chocolatey in your coffee in the morning. And if I'm hungry in the morning, I'll do something like that. I'll put a pat of butter. I'll put some cacao butter in my coffee if I'm hungry. But I don't do it every day anymore because now I'm fat adapted and I don't need that fat in my coffee. But that's So it's a nice transitional thing. But if somebody is trying to lose weight, you shouldn't be loading up your beverages with fat. Um, it's just you're not going to lose as much weight like that. But it is a good way to start to intermittent fast, and it's a certainly fine way to get your fats high enough and keep you full. I tell people get a crock pot and use it. I have three crock pots at my house. Because if I can throw my food in it in the morning and come home to dinner, that makes me very happy. And I don't have to get home late at night, like on a night like tonight, and start to prepare dinner. I do roasts in there, I do meatloaf in there, I do stews in there, I do chicken and a bacon casserole that I found a recipe online that is basically just five spices, chicken, bacon, done. It browns, it's crazy. I was so surprised by that. Even the bacon turns kind of brown and delicious in there. So lots of good crock pot recipes out there and just for the convenience of being able to feed a family or not having to cook at night, I am a big fan. Not everybody loves them, but I am a big fan. Um, cooking ahead on your days off is another option. Um, preparing ahead for use through the week is great. And I just tell people, improve your diet step by step. Don't go through your pantry and throw everything out. You'll hate me. You'll spend a lot of money. It, it's not a good idea. I mean, throw away the things that are really bad. I told somebody today to throw away Oreos. I, I don't, just there's no point in keeping them. However, it's better to evolve over time versus make such a, you know, now I have nothing in my pantry, I have to go buy everything and start from scratch. It's too daunting. But as you're gonna buy something new, and I still do this to this day. Okay, do I really need that? And if I don't, or if I do, how can I do better? So I even got my husband now making our taco seasoning with the Whole30 taco seasoning recipe as opposed to taco seasoning in the packet. So we use spices that we just buy. It's super cheap. You take little tablespoons of things, mix it up, taco seasoning, delicious. So even those little things that we've evolved over time are just little steps that every time we purchase something, we try to do a little tiny bit better. Filter your water. If you don't already, this is just something I tell people, do it sooner versus later. Don't wait to filter your water. We love the Berkey filter, um, but even something as simple as a Brita can be helpful just to get some of, the, some of the toxins out of there. Moving into a little more aggressive viewpoints, cleanses. So the note, has anyone ever done a cleanse and experienced nothing? I don't know if we want to get into sharing too much here, but if you've done a cleanse and it didn't seem to do anything, it could have been that it, it could have been it wasn't strong enough or it wasn't a good cleanse for you. It could have been that your body could not withstand the release of those toxins, so it just wouldn't do it. Our bodies are pretty smart. They're, they won't do things that will kind of 
cause you too much distress. There are definitely healing crises that happen, but if your body can't detox because pathways of elimination can't do it, then a cleanse sometimes does not work. So someone who said like, I've done cleanses, it didn't do anything, I'm suspicious because it probably couldn't. It, it, people will usually feel something when they do a cleanse. If you ever did a cleanse and felt bad during it or after, it means your body tried to let go of some of those toxins, but they just kind of got moved around. It couldn't really get rid of them efficiently. So I've done a couple cleanses over the years that I have actually, <laughs> TMI, I tell everybody everything so I'm, I've driven to the office throwing up in a bag <laughs> while I was driving here because I had to come to work and I was so sick from the cleanse and then I had to come in and get checked because I was detoxing too fast or inefficiently. So those cleanses, not so great at the time. But what it did tell me was I needed to cleanse. I was, I was detoxing, but it wasn't working well. So my pathways of elimination just needed more help and I had to back off on the cleanse and go a little bit slower. So it's the ideal time to do it <laughs> is more when your organs of elimination are in good working order. So you want to kind of do cleanses slowly or in the correct order. Um, and I'm going to talk about cleanses a little bit in a second. So that's my cleanse info. This is a cleanse that we don't necessarily stock in the office, but it's easy enough to get. This cleanse can be done a couple different ways. It can be done as a 10 day more intense cleanse, and it's basically just using this shake several times a day, either as kind of a meal replacement, or you're doing some meals and then the shakes as kind of a substitution. There are many, many different ingredients in this shake so that you don't have to take a lot of pills to do the cleanse, you're just basically doing the shake. Um, I had a patient that did this and she, she was probably about five days in to the, are those filters on? Can you turn those off? Just, oh, okay, okay, I was just making sure, sorry. I just, I didn't, I felt like I was screaming and now I'm not. Um, that cleanse, it, so she was about seven days into the little bit longer version. She, there's a 21 day version that goes with this. She was about seven days in and she called and said, I stink. I have to stop this cleanse. And I said, no, you need to keep doing the cleanse. <laughs> you stink because your body is trying to get rid of toxins out of your lymphatics. You're trying to sweat them out. You need to keep doing the cleanse. You need to drink more water. You need to keep on going. So she had to actually repeat it more times than just the one um, because her body was trying to eliminate those toxins and not doing it super efficiently, but she wasn't uncomfortable. She was just smelling the toxins as they were coming out of her. Um, happens a lot. It's, you know, it's just the body will try to be getting rid of stuff that way sometimes. So one option for a cleanse, and it's kind of the, an easy cleanse, and it's short, so it doesn't take a lot of time to kind of get things rolling with a cleanse like this. There's no cleanse that's easy, so I don't really mean it like that. We get into more aggressive cleansing that usually I tell people it is best to do these under a practitioner's um, advice and guidance because when we get into these, and these are some of the supplements, so Bowel Mover from Cellcore Biosciences is a great helper to get the bowels moving. So you have to help downstream pathways of elimination first think like sewer drains kind of like if the main drain is backed up things are trying to come out through other pathways so you're you're working toward getting the main kind of drain the main drainage pathways the downstream drainage pathways doing better then you get more aggressive behind that so using things like bowel mover this is kidney liver support. They've changed some of their names. It's not detox now, it's support. Um, there's lymphatic support. I brought that one too. And then there's something called Virad Chem Binder. I didn't bring that one in because we are currently out of stock of it. Um, but Virad Chem Binder helps if there's viral load, radiation toxicity, chemical toxicity. Um, I don't always recommend that as 
part of step one for people. It is a little more aggressive of a supplement. Sometimes I kind of push, push that back a little bit, but this can be done in, in phases as well. Like I said, these are best recommended by a practitioner because they are a little more aggressive, but part of a nice kind of new year, new you plan to kind of reset things. It's, it's good to cleanse periodically. So that's uh, one version of a cleanse. We do have similar but different product line companies. This is the Systemic Formulas Cleanse products. So they make these really conveniently in a prep phase, body phase, brain phase. So it's three phases of, of a cleanse. Each one is a month long. The prep phase cleans outside. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that different. The prep phase gets the body ready for cleansing more helps the downstream pathways, helps the bowel, helps the liver, helps the kidneys. So that's kind of helping the downstream pathways. The body phase cleanses outside the cells. The brain phase will actually go into the cells and help clean out what's in the cells and can help the brain too. So it can kind of penetrate the blood brain barrier. An aggressive cleanse. It's most people feel, um, blanket statement, most people feel very good on the prep phase most people feel not very good on the body phase and need more than one phase of that. And then the brain is the most aggressive. But some people just feel fine on all of it because you're nourishing your body all throughout. So it's as your body's detoxing, as it goes a little deeper, sometimes it doesn't feel great. But it is an indicator that it's probably working as well. So it's, these, are, these are good products. And they're easy because it's kind of all in one box. Lots of products all in one. So people can just take it and not think about it too much. So another great cleanse, the Whole30. So the Whole30 is not technically a cleanse at all, but a more of a lifestyle and diet change that can bring about major improvements in health. Um, Dr. Amanda did a lecture on the Whole30 two weeks ago. Um, we do, two weeks ago? Yep, two weeks ago. We do have a Facebook group that talks about the Whole30 within it. Um, so if you are on Facebook and you want to just search NHCAA Whole30, you can join the group. We let you in and you can join the group. You can participate, we would love that. You can watch what other people are saying. You can get recipe ideas from it. You can go back and see other things we've said in that group over the years. It's, it's kind of a timeline for other times we've done it. We didn't just start that group with this Whole30 round that Dr. Amanda is doing, we started it two years ago, three years ago. So a bit of a resource. We would love for there to be more activity in it, meaning people contributing just to, to help us out with it, meaning give each other ideas and give each other help. But the Whole30 is a valuable tool for resetting health. It takes away all grains, all sugar, all beans and legumes, all alcohol, and all dairy. It is a cleanse in that regard. So, but it's very good to find what food sensitivities you might have by that elimination style of diet. So you take all those things away that might be allergenic, and then you can kind of try reintroduction and see what happens. Um, the first time I did the Whole30, I've done it four times now. The first time I did the Whole30, um, oh boy, I came off it craving food really bad. Um, I think I did not eat enough on it that first time. I just, and now I've learned that was probably the case as I've done it other times. I didn't eat enough. And so by the time I was 30 days in, I was so hungry. Um, I wanted cheese really bad coming off of it. And I thought, cheese, that's, that'll be a good first food for me to try. I, within an Within 30 minutes of eating the cheese, I had a very bad stomach ache. And within one hour of eating the cheese, I had a headache. And I thought, well, <laughs> that is why dairy is not good for me. And I knew that I didn't do great on dairy, but I pretend like I do because I kind of like cheese a lot. So I pretend like I'm okay on dairy, but I am really not okay on dairy. Um, and that Whole30 showed me that definitively. Um, it creeps back in my life because I do love cheese. Um, but I have since, again, you know, kind of restructured and gotten the majority of it out, or at least 
using it as such a tool. When I get in trouble with cheese is when I'm using it as my like meal. Like, okay, I'm going really fast and I'm gonna eat cheese instead of food, other food. And I, I get into trouble when I start to go down the slope of cheese as a food group. So it's a, it's a factor and it helps you find those things out a little bit. FMD stands for Fasting Mimicking Diet. It is a registered name. Um, Prolon owns that. The inventor is Walter Longo. It is a diet that was researched, uh, he did research on it, um, into cancer research with it. You're mimicking a fast without actually having to fast. So that, it's a, the fasting mimicking diet truly is like a little thing you can purchase where it's like little tiny, tiny amounts of food. <laughs> and that's what you eat over five days. It's kind of like grouped in, in little packages to make it convenient. Um, there is kind of what they call it a hack for this. Um, our version is we have people do two green drinks a day, like the greens first that we carry out front or another powdered vegetable type drink with two avocados per day and then as little other food as you kind of can during that five days. Again, a more aggressive elimination style diet, but really resets things. And mimicking a fast, if somebody can't truly fast for that long, does still have some shown benefits to getting cells to turn over and, and getting health to improve. So you can always, I when I did the fast mimicking diet, which I did, I did our version, I didn't do the boxes version. Um, when I did it, I still, I worked through the whole thing, so I ate salads for lunch every day when I was doing it so that I could kind of keep functioning, and I would have a salad with my green drink at night when I got home too. Um, I didn't really eat much protein because you are trying to mimic a fast, so I was kind of just doing the green drink, the salads with a little bit of oil, um, broth, ba very basic things, very low carb, extremely low carb, very low calorie because you're trying to kind of rest the liver a little bit is the point of it. So helpful, a bit aggressive. Um, I talked about this already a little bit, lower carb, higher fat, eating to fullness and satiety with fat and protein. Carbs low in the low carb diet realm usually means under 40. Um, keto usually means under 20. I, sell, I tell people 20 to 30, I think Dr. Schmidt says under 20. So the, the healthy number that I mentioned before of 72 stands. But when you're trying to lose weight or you're trying to kind of get into more therapeutic type diets, usually you're looking at more like under 40. And then ketosis, more like under, under 30, maybe 20 for some people. So that's just more therapeutic diets versus just kind of healthy diets. Um, I'd say to people, be fat adapted. Be in a state where you don't need to eat every two to three hours. The grazing philosophy is not correct. It does not let your blood sugar go low enough to get you into fat burning mode. So when someone's constantly burning their carbs and sugar as fuel, their blood sugar is never going low enough to train your body to be fat adapted. So you want to be fat adapted is, is what I call it. So that's, I can go hours and hours and hours. My husband makes fun of me. He'll say, I know you don't need to eat, but I need to eat now. Cause I, I can just, I'll forget. I'll, I, on Christmas Eve, I didn't really eat very much and it was an accident. So when everybody else was eating a lot, I kind of didn't eat. So I didn't eat breakfast cause we were going to go to brunch. Um, we went to brunch. The brunch was horrible. Um, I got a salad. It wasn't like a buffet brunch because that would have been delightful. It was, it was a diner type scenario. I got a salad and that salad was horrible. So I thought, okay, well, I really can't eat this. So I ate a couple bites of it and I was worried. It looked like the lettuce was old. But okay, not gonna eat the salad. So I didn't really eat lunch. And then we went out and we were doing things with family and meeting family and going to church services and things like that. And I didn't eat dinner. And then we got home and I said, I didn't really eat today. <laughs> he said, no, you, you didn't, did you? Because he ate at brunch and I said, I didn't. 
but it, now it's like time for bed, so I'll eat tomorrow. So I, I really didn't eat, but I never felt bad. It didn't, it didn't affect me at all. I felt good. I was pretty hungry the next day and ate a good amount on Christmas Day, but I, I didn't feel the need to eat. I, I was okay. I wished my salad would have been better, but I'm very fat adapted, so it didn't, it didn't negatively impact me to not eat that day. That's fat adapted. <laughs> This is a resource as you're starting to move into trying to transition your diet, ptoer.com and their kind of sister site, burnfatnotsugar.com. Burn Fat Not Sugar, great resource as to why you want to be fat adapted. Lots of good information on what to eat, um, cooking recipes, things like that. And ptoer is a calculator type. So you can put in your numbers for the day once you know your macros. You can put in how much protein and carbohydrates and fat you're eating into this app and it will tell you if you're burning sugar or if you're burning fat as your fuel. It, it kind of gives you the ratios and if you're trying to lose weight, you want to be burning fat. So that it, it kind of gives you ideas on what to eat to be doing that. So sometimes the leaner things when you are trying to burn fat can be better, like chicken or fish instead of bacon and cheese, that the calculator kind of shows you those things. Not that those things are unhealthy, but they won't always help you lose weight to be eating the fattier meats and things like that. So sometimes that's a bit of a transition and the calculator can show you, even you can put your whole day totals in and it will show you how you did that day. So just a great resource that we tell people about. If you're watching this later on on Facebook, um, we're gonna say goodbye for now. If you have any questions on what we do here, you can contact us, um, our phone number, or you can email us. And if you have any questions, we'd love to help you too. Thanks for watching, like and share this video.